Dr. Troy Jackson, how are you, sir? I am wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on here. Well, thank you for coming, dude. I mean, this is basically your podcast. Like I said, I mean, we're going to do this on, I'll probably release this on the Jason Wright show, but then also on our podcast, the Authentic Health Podcast. And by Authentic Health, I guess at this point, that's what we're calling our podcast for our company. But um, that may change, but it is essentially the information that we want to uh, teach and educate educate people on with regard to health and wellness uh, for our company, Authentic Health, which we will talk more about in the future. But today, we're going to be talking about something that is incredibly critical to anyone listening to this show, which is endothelial health. And I am so glad that you came on here. I've had conversations with different folks about um, heart health, cardiovascular health. But what I really like about this, Troy, is that we're going to be kind of diving into the what's going on, if you will, of cardiovascular health. One of the things that kind of opened my eyes that I mentioned before you and I came on today was that you can actually overtrain. You know, a lot of people think that, well, when it comes to cardiovascular health, the more the better. And then a lot of people also, they don't realize that how early some of these things can set in as far as heart health. They think that, well, I'm young, I'm invincible. Uh, and then you, then you hear like, I mean, my brother, who's not, he's only three years older than me. I'm pretty sure is on blood pressure medicine already. And, and I want to talk about some of the things that, you know, some of the reasons why we should try to stay as healthy as possible from a cardiovascular standpoint to avoid these medications, because I know that there's some things that, you know, that everything comes with a trade-off, right? You know, so, so with mm -hmm. that, kind of just get us started from a physician standpoint of what your view of cardiovascular health with your patients and either, and you, you start where you want someone that is coming in like me that I like to think I've got pretty good heart health and I want to maintain that and just, and get as many miles out of my ticker and the whole system as I can to that person that maybe they just found out something simple like, you're running high blood pressure for the first time. So therefore now they're getting, they're getting anxious. So just take it where you want to Troy and trying to educate our audience on how to start those first baby steps towards good heart health. Sure. And it's heart health is affects everyone. So anyone that comes into our office, whether they're really young, you have a newborn all the way up to elderly, it touches everybody. And it touches you in a negative way if you're having problems from a heart health perspective, but you can also do a lot of things that are improving your heart health, no matter the stage of life that you're in, no matter the medical challenges you're currently facing. And a lot of people don't think of it that way. They think of heart disease as strictly heart attacks. And if I don't have a heart attack, then my heart is good. And that is not the case. That can be the case. You could not have a heart attack and have a perfectly healthy heart. But the important thing to remember is that heart disease is a process that's happening inside of our bodies over a very, very long period of time. So it could be 20 or 30 years of disease developing within the arteries themselves or within the heart, and that the heart attack is just the final process of it. Um, and so I, what I encourage people in our practice and your listeners is that heart health, heart health should be important to you. And it should be important no matter what age you're at, no matter what health stage you're currently in. Because at some point, the hope is that when you do pass away, that if it is pose a heart attack, it's because you live to a ripe old age and that was the thing that ended your life. But the hope is that it doesn't happen prematurely for you. And we know so much more about heart disease now that it can be preventable, it can be delayed, it can be reversed if you have current disease. And so there's so many tools in the toolbox and it just takes the first step of being curious and looking into it. So I guess that my initial question is for that person that's out there that's pretty healthy and they want to maintain heart health, what's probably the, well, let's just take it this way. When do you generally first see someone that might start to have a compromised cardiovascular system? Is it someone that comes in completely ignorant to the fact and they see you and you have to walk in and say, Hey, I got some news for you. Or is it someone that has some obvious symptoms, be it because of their weight, because of their inactivity, because they're struggling with VO2 max? Like what is that kind of that avatar person that comes in and is first alerted to a, a compromised, uh, you know, having compromised heart health? 
Yeah, and people come to me for a whole host of different reasons where we end up going down the pathway of their cardiovascular health. I would say primarily the main reason that I'm even bringing it up is we found something in their visit that they didn't even know about. Maybe they're coming in for their physical and their blood pressure is elevated and it's news to them, or that we did some blood work and they have some concerns on blood work that I'm sure we'll get to in a little bit that says, hey, maybe there is something wrong here. And what's what's a little bit unnerving to me, and I've only been in practice for eight years, that it seems like each year that I've been in practice, I'm seeing it ha- seeing changes, blood pressure elevations, uh, elevated cholesterol, elevated, elevated inflammation on blood work happening earlier and earlier in someone's life. So I'm having 20 year olds and 30 year olds with, with concerning findings in our physicals. They feel perfectly healthy, right? But there's something not working properly in their bodies. And what I'm, what I'm hoping in those visits is that I'm showing them that you have a long way to a heart attack, but let's go ahead and just do something now. So you never have to have that problem in the future. And you can intervene in a lot of different ways that don't require medication in your twenties and thirties. Um, I have people that come in with fatigue. They think it's fatigue for a lot of other reasons and it's really their heart the whole time. Um, those are probably the main main reasons that I have someone coming in is uh, it's they weren't expecting it just popped up and now we're having the conversation and um, yeah well you know Troy one of the things that okay so by the way folks Troy the reason why guys like Troy become doctors is because they're like pretty anal and OCD and like very very good at note taking and you know you you kind of you kind of piss me off Troy because I know you were such a better student than me not just because you're a doctor but then also whenever I have a guest before they come on the show and they send me four pages of hey here's some things we might want to talk about I'm like good lord dude you know so uh, <laughs> but so let's just kind of unpack this a little bit you know for and by the way it's kind of funny folks because Troy and I are business partners so he's you know I'm the I'm the guy that rounds out the curve on the intellect in our little business partnership that we have. I've got two doctors and James Quandall, and then you guys threw me in and I'm so glad, you know, it's our, it's our, I guess it's our own version of kind of, um, affirmative action to let, let, let the East Texas kid in, in the group to, to try to round it out. But one of the things I do want to cover here, because a lot of people, I, and here's why I want to do, it. I want to look at this as like, like a puzzle because a lot of people think that heart health is just simply, I don't eat fats. I exercise and that's it. And the, the, and as long as I'm not having high blood pressure or getting sent to the hospital with a heart attack, then I'm probably in pretty decent heart health. But like one of the things that you wrote in your notes here that I think is important is that one cardiovascular death is the number one reason for death still to this day, but it's not just always an immediate heart attack. It looks like a stroke, neurodegenerative disease, type two diabetes, kidney disease, all of these different things can be indications of poor heart health that a lot of people may not be associating. So kind of talk about, and, and by the way, as I look at this, Troy, and you tell me if I'm wrong, man, when I see stroke, which a lot of people think is a stroke is kind of like, um, kind of like cancer. They think, Oh, don't know where that came from, just out of the blue, or neuro, neurodegenerative disease, meaning, you know, they start to, you know, whether it's on, early onset Alzheimer's or some sort of dementia, uh, type 2 diabetes, meaning that they're becoming that, that heavily insulin resistant. They see these things or they, they start to appear, but they don't, they don't equate that with heart health. So these all look like life choices or lifestyle symptoms in a lot of ways. Do you see that? And is it more genetic, lifestyle, age? Kind of is there a common denominator for these other factors? Again, when I see type 2 diabetes, I don't immediately think cardiovascular. I think sugar, glucose, mm-hmm. I, insulin, and because that's what all the commercials that Big Pharma is putting on TV tell me is that type 2 diabetes, and I'm going to go take a pill or I'm going to give myself a shot so I can keep crushing cake and, you know, and, and not die, as opposed to, hey, you might be compromising your your heart health. So kind of talk to us about how all of these things kind of play a role and how they can contribute to being the number one cause of death that we see today. Yeah, and what's fascinating about that list is cardiovascular death from heart attacks is the number one reason for death. But on the list of the top 10 reasons for death, you do have strokes and neurodegenerative disease and diabetes and kidney disease. 
So, and, and all of that is linked to poor blood vessels that are being damaged and causing other problems. So you can make the argument that cardiovascular disease is five of the top 10 reasons for death. So that's, that's a very important point to make. That is, that's why I was saying at the beginning, it affects everyone, whether it's you directly or a person, you know, and so this is why it's such an important topic because um, it can be sinister. So other ways it can pop in is elevated blood pressure. We just talked about erectile dysfunction would also be a sign of cardiovascular disease. Changes in your eyesight can be related to cardiovascular disease. So there's all these different things. And the common denominator, the connection to all of them is blood vessels. So how well are you getting blood traffic to the cells of these different organ systems to bring in nutrients, to get out waste products? And if your vascular system is compromised, then those organs get compromised, those cells, individual cells. You've had uh, my colleague Gus on here a number of times, and he always talks about cellular health. The number one part of cellular health is, is providing nutrients to those cells and getting rid of waste products from the cells and back into the blood to be cleared out. And so that's how this all connects. So you can make the argument that most of disease can be related to a problem of blood flow. And that blood flow can, is almost always going to be some lifestyle interventions that are the cause of the damage or the cause of the reason why it's been compromised. There are genetic things that contribute to that, of course, and some of those are unavoidable, obviously, but the impact it has on your body can be worked on. So it's never this, this issue of, I can't do anything about it. There's always something that we can do that helps improve your vascular health, the blood flow itself, and how your body is responding when there are things that are happening to you. You know, one of the things that kind of surprised me here, the two things, <clears throat> well, one I knew, and it still surprises me every time I see it, was that for over 50, this, this is from your notes, exactly, for over 50% of people, their first symptom of heart disease is sudden heart attack or sudden cardiac death. So literally over half the people that have heart disease they're not alerted to it when they go to see Dr. Troy or Dr. Gus. They instead are they have a heart attack and die. And it's like, oh, you had heart disease too late now. That's nuts, man. Yeah, it's it's insane when you think about it. And um, and the other part is that most people don't even know that they had heart disease at all. Again, I'm from blood work. And so that's not to to paint a picture that this should be something that's scary that's lurking behind us, but it's just painting the picture that this is something that's important that we need to be thinking about it early on in life. And if you're a listener and you're in your sixties, seventies, eighties, and you haven't thought about it yet, it's time for us to start thinking about it now because there's still things that we can do to reduce your risk. Well, I tell you why you should start thinking about if you're in your sixties, seventies and eighties, and you haven't done anything is because you tell me right here that 33% of young people without traditional ris uh, risk factors will develop plaque by middle age. So, that starts mm -hmm. at a so it starts at a pretty young age. Yeah, they've done biopsies, uh, artery biopsies on you know, unfortunately children that have passed away for a lot of different reasons, and and many of those they can see the very first signs of heart disease. They're called fatty streaks in the artery wall itself, and these are kids that are mm -hmm. that are still elementary school age that you know, they shouldn't have disease, um, and then you have. People, young adults who have plaque, uh, there's a stat next next to that. 67% of people will have some evidence of vascular disease on imaging. So these are people, this is very interesting. They went in for a study, um, different, different types of vascular studies, perfectly healthy. They were, anybody that had other types of chronic diseases were screened out. And they just went in and got a scan for no other reason. And over half of people had some evidence of disease. And I do scans here in the office and we will I'm sure we'll talk about those. And I see the same thing that most people have plaque or have vascular inflammation that, and they're surprised by it. And it just shows you that there's never too early to intervene on this. Well, and one of the things that's insane about this, Troy, that I'm just learning the, the deeper I go into these waters of health and wellness and, and functional medicine with you guys is that so much of our health is determined by those early years. For example, heart health and muscular or, or lean body mass. Okay. There's a correlation there. More lean body mass. Obviously it's a kind of a reflection of lifestyle and other things. And it also shows to your heart, your heart health. And at the age of 30, 
and I'm 49, at the age of 30, you start losing that muscle development, right? Your, your muscles start to kind of start to fade. And then we get to 40 to 50, then you really, you better have, I've started telling people, and I stole this idea. It's definitely not mine as an original thought, but I've started telling people when it comes to like lean body mass, if you're younger, if you're in your 30s or your 20s for that matter, you got to start like you're you're saving for retirement because you're going to be making draws on whatever muscle lean body mass that you are able to develop in your younger years whenever you start to get old like me. And then whenever you look at these numbers that heart health and then the fact that, yeah, like you say, 67% of everybody, that means pretty much anybody that walks through your doors is going to at least show some sign of a vascular disease uh, it, it's somewhere then the earlier you start tracking this the better and i'm hoping that i know we got a lot more to talk about but i'm hoping that right now everybody is at least considering going to see their doctor and get the imaging and just start to get that baseline it's like what gus and i always talk about when it talk whether it's gut health or anything else on these blood panels there's no way to know where you are or where you're going until you can actually look at the data and just first start there. You've got to know where your your benchmark is. And the last time, the last thing I want to talk about here that you um, put in these stats is 50% of adults have HTN sign of vascular damage. Now talk a little bit about that. What is that vascular damage? What does it look like? Kind of what does that mean? Yeah, so that's that's shorthand there for hypertension, so high blood pressure. Yep. So fifty percent of adults uh, will have high blood pressure. High blood pressure. There's there's arguments on what that means. The most aggressive response would be any number above one hundred and twenty over eighty mm -hmm. uh, would be the more aggressive. That's what cardiovascular societies will tend to to use. The looser guidelines would be anything above one hundred and forty over ninety. Um, my, my opinion waffles a little bit here, but if someone is coming to see me because they want to improve their cardiovascular health, I'm going to try to get them to 120 over 80 or less. And if they're above that, we're doing something, whether it's a lifestyle change, a supplement, a prescription, depending on what their risk factors are. If they, if that's what their goal is, then we're going to be as aggressive as possible to keep it under that 120 over 80. There are studies that do show that incrementally above that, that cutoff, there is increased risk. And again, it's a risk over time. So it's something that is, you know, your blood pressure is 150 over 90, and it's been like that for five, 10, 15 years in your, third, in your 30s or in your 40s. That's the compounding problem. You talked about investing in your health. You know, there's a compounding interest of health. So the earlier you start, the easier it is and the better results you get. Obviously, you can start later in life and still do it. It just takes a little bit more work. But there's a compounding whatever the negative version of those compounding interests of, of poor health, where if left to your own devices and your body, if you're, it's not working optimally, it will continue to, to damage itself. And that's what we're trying to avoid. And I want to ask you a real quick question. I want to talk to Gus about this and I was going to get both of you guys to have this discussion with me and I'm not for, or well, I guess for myself, I'm against, because I'm against trying to uh, any sort of pharmaceutical, if I can help it. I don't, I don't want to do any sort of intervention unless it's absolutely necessary not because I'm some big anti big pharma guy or something like that, just because to me, it's an indication that I want my body to function as authentically a little shameless plug there as possible. Um, and so therefore I don't want to be one of these people. Like I think, uh, Peter Tia is talking about, he talks about statins a lot. Okay. And so, and tell me if I'm making the correct correlation. When I see that 67% of people have evidence of vascular disease of some, of some sort, is that why statins have become popular even for people who are air quotes, heart healthy? Is that why? Because they're just trying to kind of use almost, and this, I know I'm probably going to say everything wrong here, but is that why they're almost like using a statin as sort of a supplemental is that what they're doing? I mean, why why would somebody that's healthy take a statin? And if you feel comfortable giving your opinion on it, if you don't, I understand it too. We're not giving any advice today. We're not establishing a, a patient-doctor relationship today. But kind of give me your take on where statins for healthy people fit into this picture, Troy. Yeah. So, and this is obviously a controversial discussion. Um, the, the argument that Peter Tia and other doctors make uh, would that fall into this camp would say that 
getting your, your APA B, so one of your cholesterol metrics that we'll talk about as low as possible, as early as possible, is the best way that you can stave off the development of heart disease in the future. And so they, he does use some Mendelian randomization studies, so studies on, uh, on genetic elevations in cholesterol and what happens to them when they're early on in life, and then genetic ele- uh, uh, lowering of, of APOB, where they almost have no cholesterol, and what happens to them as they move through life. And so that's where that argument comes from. And it's, it's based off of modeling. There's clearly no study that says if you've lowered APOB for 50 years that you're not going to have disease. So it's, it's an assumption of benefit there. But it's, there's data behind it, and I'm, so I definitely don't discredit that. The, I, I prescribe medicines all the time, so I have a different opinion on, on medications and their utility, and there are some useful moments. I, I am a little bit hesitant on using statins for someone for the sole reason of improving my, my health in the future. I think there's other avenues we can go. You can make the argument that if the person has a side effect of the medication, then the harms outweigh the benefit at that point, because they had no benefit to begin with, as far as we know, if their LDL or their other cholesterol metrics were okay, maybe not optimal, but okay. Um, So there's a lot of other tools in the toolbox that I personally like to reach before reaching for something like a stat medication, and and he'll reach for two or three different medications right off the bat. but everyone has their own opinion of how we get there. And I think it's good that he's having that discussion on a platform that a lot of people are listening. Cause let's be honest, he does help bring heart disease and people's concern about heart disease to the forefront. It's really good for me to have conversations with people who are already having a vested interest. They've already been reading and listening and trying to figure out what's going to be best for them. Yeah. And, and I don't know this part about, even though I've probably listened to, I don't even know how many episodes of the drive, his podcast or, or read something about his take on statins, but is, does, does Peter Tia or any of those guys that are saying, or, or that are using statins in their toolkit, even though he's like probably one of the most remarkably he- healthy over 50 guys there is, is, is it because of genetic testing that shows that they have something in their genetic makeup that their, their, G- their genome is expressing the very, strong likelihood for heart disease later on in life. And so that's why they're doing it as a preventive measure, or is it just because, or is he just basing it on kind of universal numbers? Cause that, that I don't know. Yeah. Uh, my understanding is that he's basing it off of uh, optimal numbers okay. for from people who've had heart disease. So a lot of studies Got it. looking at what's called residual risk. So they had a heart attack once and you're trying to prevent their second, mm-hmm. that there are studies that APA B levels really low, less than 50, have improvement. And so he's extrapolating that data and saying, well, if you're 30 and your APOB is above 50, let's get it below that. And then you will never develop heart disease would be the argument. Okay. Okay. Well, that, that, that kind of makes sense. I remember though, one time my mom asked me just out of the blue, we were talking about stuff and I am so, there's, there's few things that I'm real vain about Troy, but when, when it comes to my health, Like I got so offended. I was just telling somebody on an interview I did earlier today that whenever I went into the uh, doctor for my first uh, colonoscopy, first of all, it kind of was a shame, dude, that like I'm walking, I walk in and everybody is asking me like, so why are we doing this today? And I'm just like, well, because guys like Dr. Gus and, you know, just, and ever, it's just, I'm 49, it's time. Oh, so you're just here for a checkup? No problems? Yeah, no, I'm just doing this because I'm getting old and it's time to have my first colonoscopy. Oh, okay. I must have answered that question three times. And people were like, you know, I guess they they just were amazed that somebody would actually proactively schedule a colonoscopy and go in and do it as a preventive measure. And whenever I'm getting checked in, this nurse, she's asking me about all the medications and the drugs I use and all this stuff. And I mean, you know, do, do you... I mean, and of course, these these questionnaires have gotten so crazy now. You know, do you beat your dog once or twice a day? Do you do any coke? Did you do any coke before you came? You know, how much acid do you drop? And do you feel safe at home? Do you, are you okay? Does your wife beat you? These questionnaires are so weird. But the thing that got me the most offended was like when she's asking me all these medications. I'm like, no. I mean, do you take blood pressure? No. Look at me. Do I look like someone who would take blood pressure medicine? And it's like it's just. And I was an anomaly. And she finally goes, well. Do you ever go to the doctor? I said, yes, once a year 
for my for my annual checkup. And now, of course, you know, Dr. Gus is doing my screenings for my blood work and my gut biome and that sort of thing. But yeah, hopefully that's all I have to. But man, it's just gotten to where the norm is everybody's on something, everybody's sick, and you just and it just it drives me crazy. But I get so offended when it, and my mom asked me one time, Are you on statins? And I'm like, no, I'm not on statins. Why would I be on statins? And then, of course, now I could get asked that question by one of our people that's healthy and well, because that's kind of become one of the tools that people are using to kind of prevent future heart or, you know, cardiovascular damage or whatever. So anyway, I digress about my vanity when it comes to my health. I'm more, I get more offended. I mean, I, I'm more interested in not taking medicine to, and be, and still being healthy than I am about having a six pack. You know, that's just how I, I want the stuff inside working like it's supposed to. And if it shows on the outside, fine. If not, I'm cool with that. All right. So let's give this audience, Troy Jackson, MD, a little bit of just kind of an understanding of the anatomy of the cardiovascular system so that we can start to give people, I want people and for the audience listening, look, if Troy gets kind of like, if, if, he, if he loses you in this, and I don't think he will because he's very good at describing this stuff where even people, again, a bumpkin from East Texas like me can understand this stuff. But I, I think it's very important, Troy, and I'm glad that you put this in your notes to give people an understanding about how the system works. It's just like if you were in your home and you were trying to take care of your plumbing or trying to take care of your garden and you, you, wanted, you wanted to know where the drainage was and how to keep it clear and how to keep everything functioning properly – I think it's very important. So let's talk a little bit about starting with, you know, the heart and your blood vessels and kind of just take us through how this system works so that people can get kind of a mental picture of how we're trying to keep this as healthy as possible. Yeah. And, and this part is always fascinating to me, but it's probably the most boring section of this entire podcast we'll go through. But I think it's helpful to have a foundational understanding of your heart and your blood vessels, what they are, what they do. Because when we get into how things can go wrong and we get into how do we make them better or how do we keep them better, it, it'll make a lot more sense if you know the terminology and really what we're looking at. So cardiovascular system is the system of your heart and your blood vessels. And when we honestly, when we think about the cardiovascular system, most people are thinking about their heart. We've said it multiple times here, heart health and, and heart disease. But if you want to be specific, the disease actually starts in blood vessels. So if you're really worried about your cardiovascular health, it's mostly concerned about your vascular health and the quality of your blood vessels. And when the blood vessels are damaged, then they get sent to your heart or sent to your brain. And that's where those heart attacks or strokes can happen. But everything starts in a blood vessel. So without getting too much in the weeds, your heart is a pump and it pumps blood forward into the body through something called arteries. And then blood returns to the heart through veins. And without getting into details, disease will happen in arteries, but don't happen in veins. So everything we talk about will be about the artery side of this whole system. There's 60,000 miles of blood vessels in our body. So there, it's a huge, huge network. And and they, they range in sizes. And the easiest way to think about it is to think about our road system. So your the biggest artery in your body is the aorta. It's about three centimeters in diameter. Think of that like the interstate. Then it gets smaller into smaller arteries, then something called arterioles, which are smaller than that, and then into capillaries. So that's going from the interstate to the exit ramp, to the highway, to the road. And then capillaries would be like your driveway. So we're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And capillaries can get so small that their that blood flow has to happen where the blood cells line up in a single file line as they go through. So not a lot of space at all. And, and then the capillary beds are what is feeding your individual cells. So we think about the, the arteries around our heart, and those are obviously very important, but we also want to be concerned about the capillaries, these really tiny microscopic vessels that are feeding our cells and they're helping our cells stay healthy, that we want to keep those vessels healthy as well. So that's the, the overarching view of the vessels. I'm happy to go into the details of the arteries themselves. I think that will be helpful talking about the endothelium. Yeah, Can no, we go do that? I, I, absolutely. Okay. So the vessel is made up of layers 
and it's a tube and inside the tube is called the lumen and that's where blood is flowing. So going from the inside of the vessel out, the most the innermost layer is called the endothelium. That's what we're going to be talking about mostly today. The endothelium has direct contact with the blood itself. And overlying the endothelium is a gel slippery structure called the glycocalyx. So we're going to talk about those two structures mostly today. The endothelium is a single cell layer thick. So incredibly, incredibly tiny, but incredibly powerful and incredibly important. And we'll get into that. As we go into the artery wall, you have the intima media. That's the muscle layer. It's the layer that's determining the size of the vessel, if it's going to dilate or constrict. So it's using the muscle. Blood pressure medications will affect that layer mostly. And then the outside layer is called adventitia. It's mostly for structure um, and protection of the artery itself. But we won't get into those layers. We're mostly going to just focus on the endothelium and the glycocalyx. Okay. Well, Anything you want to say about that? Okay. Well, then let's go through. Let's, let's start with the endothelium. Kind of how, you know, where, where do we start with this? And and obviously it'll lead to how do we keep it as healthy as possible? Yeah. So, and this gets into a little bit of uh, controversy as well. I believe in a lot of, a lot of uh, doctors and people smarter than me that the endothelium is the start, the where heart disease starts. And so protecting the endothelium will protect your vessels from getting damaged and protect you from having heart disease. So the endothelium itself is, like I said earlier, a single cell layer, and it lines up the entirety of your blood vessels. So from the aorta all the way down to the capillary has this single layer of cells. You can think of it sort of like skin or a tile floor. There's these really tight um, junctions. These cells are, are joined tightly together, and it's a, it creates a, a barrier. And this barrier is semi-permeable, meaning it allows certain things in and it doesn't allow other things. And so you need to have a healthy endothelium to maintain that proper barrier because if things are flowing through your blood, some things need to get to your cells and some things don't need to get into your cells like inflammation or you know, certain cholesterol particles getting stuck in, inside the artery wall itself. So you need a really good barrier. And so that's what the endothelium does. Um, it's a, it's, it serves as a communication So also. So it's also telling the body what cells need. So if the cells are injured or there's a virus present, then the body knows where it is and will go and try to flow through the bloodstream to that cell and intervene when necessary. So that's the endothelium. The, oh, but over that, you have the glycocalyx. And the glycocalyx is a slippery, some people refer to it as a Teflon-like like structure, under microscope, it actually looks like hair and it's combines with water and it makes a gel. And those hairs are just these little sugar molecules. And this is the most recent finding in cardiovascular anatomy in the eighties, I believe is when they first discovered this. And the glycocalyx is almost like the bouncer. It's, uh, or is what I often think of as lotion or sunscreen on top of your skin. It's the protectant for the most important layer of your blood vessels. And the glycocalyx serves a lot of different roles um, from regulating what interacts with endothelium. So something floats by and, and it's like, oh, the, these cells over here need this. Come and bring it in. Uh, or no, I don't want you anywhere close to my cells. You're going to keep flowing along and not come by. So it regulates that permeability. Like I said, it provides lubrication. Blood coagulates or, get, or clots when it gets sluggish and slows down. And so you want blood to be flowing very smoothly across the blood vessel, not slowing down or getting stuck at all. Especially when you think of capillaries, when they're so tiny and the blood cells flowing through in a single file line, you want those flowing through as fast and efficiently as possible and not getting stuck or bogged down. In that gel structure, it also has uh, anti-inflammatory uh, enzymes, the most important being SOD, which is superoxide dismutase. Superoxide is one of the worst, uh, and one of the bad actors when it comes to inflammation. And so it's the main neutralizer for that. It has immune cells in there. It has um, anti-clotting factors in there as well. So it's this wonderful matrix of things to protect your endothelium. The last thing that it does is it understands the role of, of how fast blood is flowing by it. So it's, it's a sheer stress signal. So it can sense the speed in which blood is flowing past it. And that 
will send an electrical signal to the endothelium to say, hey, we need more nitric oxide because blood is flowing too fast here. We need to dilate the blood vessels or the blood flowing is not very fast. We need to speed it up. And so it's a great communicator of blood flow itself. So is this communication process what's happening whenever I eat a high carb food, like like cake or something, all of a sudden I look down and I've got veins like Ben Greenfield. Is this what's going on? Hmm. I wouldn't know about, I don't know about that, making that connection, okay. but if you have this cake and your blood, at least temporarily for you uh-huh. is elevated with blood sugar, uh-huh. that can potentially be damaging to the artery lining. And so your glycocalyx is protecting sugar, those sugar molecules, glucose molecules from touching and interacting with the endothelium and telling it to pass on through finding cells that need glucose and having it suck it back up so it doesn't have to stay in the bloodstream very long. Okay. And another probably very lay person question, when it comes to the glycocalyx or the endothelium, which one do I have the most control of actually keeping healthy through through just daily choices? Or is it kind of one one affects the other? Which which lever can I actually control better than the other? Or is there one? Yeah, so they work together. Okay. So a If you think of it in a stepwise fashion, the glycocalyx gets damaged first and then the endothelium gets damaged. So you, the glycocalyx is removed, you've lost the bouncer. And so the endothelium can get, get injured by whatever is flowing by in the bloodstream, but they both work together. And so I wouldn't focus just on glycocalyx support without also thinking about the endothelium and vice versa. And is this control based on what you eat, what you don't eat, or like, is this managing your, your glucose intake, your meaning sugar intake and, and fat, you know, heavy saturated fats. I mean, when we're talking about the the choices we can make, or is it more physical? Is it more exercise? Is what, what are the actual steps that we're going to take to try to keep those two things as healthy as possible? Yes. Yeah, so it's everything. It's everything you just said. So we're getting into that realm of endothelial dysfunction. How do we protect ourselves from a, a malfunctioning system, a damaged endothelium? And what you're really trying to protect is that the endothelium, the main thing it's doing for us that's healthy is it's making nitric oxide. And uh, it's one of the main places the nitric oxide is made. You and, and Gus had a great uh, podcast number of months ago about nitric oxide. Mm-hmm. I encourage people to go listen to that specifically. Um, but the endothelium is the place that that is made. And so when it's damaged, you can't make it anymore. Um, but what happens? How, do you, how does this get damaged in the first place? So the list is long. And that's probably why their heart disease is so ubiquitous in our society. So things that can damage the glycocalyx or the endothelium would be high blood pressure, high cholesterol, inflammation for a lot of different ways. This ties back into your overtraining comment at the very beginning. If you're overtraining and you're putting a lot of stress on the system and it's day in and day out, you're not allowing for time for recovery, you're building up these oxidants in the body um, that are that damage this lining uh, more than you'd expect. You do see this in ultra marathon runners. They'll have plaque development. Uh, even though they're otherwise very healthy. And there's a thought that it's because of their overtraining that has caused a damaged endothelium and caused them to have plaque development, even though they're healthy. One of the Um, things that you put in your notes, I'm so glad you did, is the link to endothelium to the gut cell lining. I think that, you know, it gets hammered home a lot now more than you said. I mean, that's where Gus and I started when we first started talking about kind of our series on just the foundations of health. And it was started with the gut kind of tie these two together as far as the endothelium and it's linked to the gut and the signaling that happens between those two and kind of why we you always hear about gut health. But again, it's kind of like one of those things I was talking about earlier, Troy is like all, a lot of these other factors we don't link because if you're just a normal person out there and you don't geek out on this stuff, like I do and like you do professionally, then you think heart health, as long as I don't smoke, I don't eat tons of butter and i exercise every once in a while. Well, what's one got to do with the other? The gut plays a role in all of this. Kind of talk a little bit about that linkage. Yeah. So the, the gut and the blood vessels sort of act in the same way. There's something flowing through a tube and the body's trying to figure out, is this good or bad? Do I bring it in? Do I keep it out? And so they both work a different way. They both work in that in similarly in that way. But to your question, the gut is the main place to figure out what's coming in from our food, what's coming from our environment, and uh, keeping out things that we don't want. 
like uh, uh, you know certain things that we may be consuming that may be getting to the bloodstream or uh, opportunistic pathogenic pathogenic bacteria that's creating endotoxins, bacterial toxins that get pushed into our bloodstream and that's causing damage downstream. We all, I mean, in, in my training as a Western medicine doctor, the gut is separate from the rest of the body, just like every other organ system is separate from the rest of the body. But we know that everything is connected. And so the health of your gut determines the amount of inflammation that you have, determines the amount of nutrients that you absorb, determines um, you know, what bacteria viruses may be eating into your bloodstream that is causing damage downstream. And so maintaining a healthy gut in part will maintain your healthy endothelium because you're, re- you're removing a lot of those damage signals. So I guess let's get into the kind of the bad news for people that may have it. So whenever all of a sudden they've got some endothelial dysfunction, and and this is the kind of the scary thing. And it's why, I mean, I don't want to scare people. I'm like, you. I mean, I don't, people shouldn't all of a sudden start looking at their arm and going, oh my gosh, hope my endothelial is okay in there, you know, but there's a good chance that there's some signs, a 67% chance that people are going to have some sign of something, right? So mm-hmm. kind of what do those things start to look like? What, what does it mean when we're talking about endothelial dysfunction? Yeah. So there's there are some testing that you can do that will give you an answer as to endothelial dysfunction, the presence of it or not. But you can do a easy back of the napkin sort of run through to see where where do I stand with my endothelial health. So if you're a listener and you have high blood pressure, if you have erectile dysfunction, um, if you have diabetes, if you have an autoimmune condition, you can just make the assumption that you have a damaged endothelium. You, there's lots of inflammation and, and stress and, and, uh, and um, things like high blood sugar that's just damaging the walls of the artery day in and day out that's just causing that, that damage to happen. So you can just go, that's okay, just go ahead and make that assumption. Um, if you're over the age of 50, the ability to create nitric oxide is about 50%. So it decreases with age. Uh, so you have to use these backup pathways through your diet. And that can also be problematic too, which, which we can get into. But so if you're over the age of 50, you can also also make the assumption that maybe your endothelium, maybe it's not damaged, but it definitely needs to be uh, protected more so than it used to be when you were in your 20s and 30s. And then, you know, if you have any inflammatory condition or process that's happening, you can kind of assume that this is what's going on. Uh, the good news for all this, yes, I don't. My job is not to scare people; really, is to empower people, to show them the the power that their body has when it comes to healing and restoration. And the first step is just knowing that it's there, knowing that there could be a problem if you're already healthy, or knowing that there is a problem if you're not healthy. And it's taking the steps to heal and repair. the The messaging in in the traditional medical model is that there is no reversal; that it's all a progressively worsening disease. And so you need more and more medications to keep you from having an event. And I think that's sad. I don't think that's true. I know it's not true. I see it in our clinic all the time that it just takes direction. It just takes time and takes guidance uh, in the right steps. It takes thinking outside the box a little bit to try to help improve your health in these different ways and not just relying on a, on a medication to make a number look good. Um, so when we're thinking about the endothelium and the glycocalyx, the, like we said, the first step is, if you don't mind, let's talk about this. The first step yeah. is just knowing that it's there. Absolutely. I think that's probably the first place to start with. And so if you go to your doctor and you get some blood work um, done, you may ask about some inflammatory markers. So an easy one to do is a high sensitivity CRP. Lots of data that an elevated CRP above one, high sensitivity CRP above one, means that there's enough inflammation present to damage the endothelium. You can get a little bit deeper, and we do this in our precision patients all the time, homocysteine, um, LPPLA2, a molecule called ADMA, IL-6. These are all different ways of measuring inflammation uh, in different, different pathways. Some are immune system, some are vascular specific, some are just general inflammatory markers. That's a, first, that's a good place to look. You can look at cholesterol and look at lipids. So that's your lipid panel. We talked about ApoB, apolipoprotein P, LP little a, genetic risk factor for heart disease. So these are these are very easy. Some of these are easier tests to get. Some are a little bit tough, and you have to 
maybe find a physician that will order these for you. Uh, the last one would be your metabolic health. So fasting insulin, fasting glucose, your A1C, your triglycerides, uric acid, all of those are easy tests to get. And if you're having elevations in a couple of these things, then I would pay attention. I would say, you know what, these are, these are risk factors for vascular disease. I need to look deeper. I need to do something about this. And maybe you do something about them like right then and there, but the next step would be imaging. So all the blood work is telling you that is that you have a risk factor for an illness. You have a risk factor for vascular disease, but it's not saying that you have vascular disease. Mm -hmm. And this does come up a lot, and maybe it's just the nature of what we do. People come to see us. Someone told me I had X, Y, or Z, and they wanted me to take a medication, and I want to look deeper before I do that. And that's a that's a great thing to do. Sometimes the medication is the correct answer. We'll find out, but sometimes it's not. You know, we'll we'll do imaging, and uh, what we do in our office is an ultrasound called a CIMT ultrasound, where we look at the vessel directly and look in presence of inflammation or presence of plaque. And if it's not there, okay, I feel pretty good about that. Even though you have these risk factors, I don't see evidence of heart disease. You can get a calcium score, that's a CT scan. Um, you can get a, what's called a coronary CTA, which is a calcium score, but with dye, with uh, IV contrast, so you can see a lot better in the vessels. And if those tests look good, then we can deal with your risk factors in a more holistic way. We don't have to jump straight to medications necessarily. But if you get those imaging studies and like 67% of people, it's lit up with issues with plaque, then that colors how aggressive we need to be. It may still not be medications, but it may be that we got to get these numbers from red to black in the next four months. And we have to be really aggressive with it. It may be that we need to layer on at least a medication uh, for a period of time just to calm the system down. It's kind of like putting the fire out. And then we can talk about coming off of it once you've improved other aspects of your health. So one the of hard the- part here, sorry, I'm just, I'll no. finish just saying the hard part with all this is that it can be hard to get. So it, it does take a little bit of um, prodding and polite prodding on your part, but this is at the end of the day, your health uh, and it's, it's your heart. And, and, and I wasn't trained in, in understanding any of these things that this is something that I'm just really fascinated about and interested in and just learn but your doctor may just not know a, a lot about it because it's not part of the standard medical curriculum. And so it's, it's perfectly okay to come in saying, this is what I would like to do based off of these reasons. And uh, can you help me get those things? And if not, then you can find another doctor. Or there's online, there's uh, companies online that'll do lab testing for you outside of insurance, do imaging outside of insurance. So there's ways to get these things if you really want them. But obviously as a primary care doctor, uh, I, I prefer the route of partnering with your doctor to help you get them and then interpret them for you. And, and maybe in the process that doctor's learning something along the way too. So one of the things that shocks me, Troy, and and today is a perfect example. So I've got my car, my Tahoe up at the Chevy dealership right now. And, you know, it used to be whenever you went to get your oil changed, eventually you're kind of sitting in the waiting room and the guy would come in from the service department with his little clipboard and see me like, Dr. Jackson, Troy Jackson, look around. You're like wanting to hide because they're going to sit down. They're going, hey, uh, Dr. Jackson, how you doing? Uh, We just want to let you know your car is pretty much about to blow up. But if you get a new filter, a new Johnson rod, your tires rotated, you know, we we flush out the hydration system. They start telling you all these different things, but they get this whole list. And by the way, we can do it all today, right here, right now. We've already got it up. So your car, and by the way, most everybody can rattle off numbers. I'm going to get my oil changed every 3,000 miles. I'm going to get my tires rotated every 8,000 miles. We know all these things intuitively about our freaking car and now they've made it so easy that today my car up at the chevrolet dealership they text me a video walk around of everything that needs to be done a list of all the things that need to be done all i have to do is check off the ones i want hit yes do an e-signature boom they take care of it you go to the doctor and it's just this big mystery people don't know anything about what their, you know, their, their glucose levels, they have no idea what their blood sugar levels need to be. Their A1C, they, they hear their doctor talk about it if it's bad, but if it's okay, they don't have a clue. And what you just said, I think is so important because I, I went through this with my primary care physician. I went 
for before Gus and I started talking all the time, I would go and I would get a uh, I would get my 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 blood work done, and then no news was good news. I would never ask to see it. I would, and they wouldn't proactively send it to me. It might be in a my chart or something, but never. And the only extra and that they would offer would be, do you want to get your testosterone levels checked? That was the only extra. It wasn't until I started working with Gus and started understanding functional medicine. I actually took one of Mike Mutzel's um, blood work courses. Uh, he has high intensity health, great podcast, and the uh, founder of uh, mm. Mile Science. You know, great dude. And it wasn't until I took his class that I was able to go in and go, "Hey, I want to have some of these extra tests done. I want to have, I want, I want, I want to know more." And they're like, "Again, it's kind of like whenever I went to the hospital to get my colonoscopy, they're like, why would you want that? What, what, what are you talking about?" And and to your point, a lot of physicians they are so trained they they aren't like you guys, like you and Gus, that are into functional medicine and precision care, and they're just kind of, especially primary care physicians, uh, they just. It's kind of like diagnose, prescribe, diagnose, prescribe. Oh, you're here for a checkup. Well, here, let's go through these things and you check the boxes and okay, you're on your way. I think this is so important. And I can tell the the, the people out there listening, if it seems overwhelming, yeah, it, it can be. But with just a little bit of research, you will start to figure out the things that really move the needle and the things that you should look at. And by the way, Troy, and I don't want to get you in a fight with uh, with big insurance, but like of these things that we're looking for, do you have an idea of what percentage of these are automatically covered on a standard well visit or versus the ones that you really, they're not covered by insurance, but they probably, sh but you still need to be looking at I me. Mean, do you have an idea of what percentage that is? Because I know there's a lot of these that you and Gus would like people to do that insurance for whatever reason. And due to with my connections in Washington and stuff, I, that's one of the things I want to proactively start doing is saying, hey, if you want to, if you want to really, you know, better the healthcare system guys, as long as it's like it is right now, where we're going to have marketplace insurance. These are some things that we need to broaden the the coverage or, to help people screen for preventive care. Do you have a percentage kind of in mind of what gets covered versus what doesn't on these blood tests? Yeah. Let me go back for a little bit. The, you know, the, the problem, the problem with our medical system right now is it's when you come to the the doctor, it's, Am I sick or not sick? That's the it's question sick, yeah, that you're right. answering, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're not sick, then you're okay. Yeah. And that's the and that's how we're trained, and that's how I practice medicine. You know, before I came to Authentic Health, and and but it, that doesn't it didn't feel good to me to to do it that way. And partly it's because I have these moments, these patients that will that I'll say, hey, you know, your blood pressure's up, you have diabetes now. Let's go ahead and start this medication. And, the, and we live in Appalachia and people don't like the medical system anyway. And they say, no, I'm not going to do that. And you're like, oh, okay, well, why don't you try to do, you know, just cut out the soft drinks and walk your neighborhood or walk the hills. There's always the hills in Asheville. So walk the hills um, and come back and see me. And they come back and see me and they've lost 30 pounds. Their blood pressure is controlled. Their A1C is now normal. And you're like, well, shoot, the medicine I was going to give you was going to do one of those things. Yeah. And you just fixed three things I can measure, but I'm confident you fixed a slew of other things that I didn't measure. That's the power of the body and the system. And so the passion that, that Gus and I have is in the, in the itch that we like to scratch is you, your body is healthy and well, it may not be right now, but it can get back to that state and just need some guidance there. And so the way we want to practice medicine, and, and there's lots of other people out there that do this is that we want to practice health and maintaining health and maintaining wellness and identifying times when you are deviating from your health, deviating from wellness. And we pick up on it as hey, this, these mar markers are used to be optimal. Now they're not what's going on here. All right, let's move you back to optimal states. Let's make some tweaks and keep you from ever needing to go to the ER or needing to ever have the conversation about a medication. And I want patients to feel empowered to have their health run like that. But first it takes recognizing that I'm not sick, but I may not be well, I may not be healthy. And so I need to first figure out, I need to first take my car to the dealership and get the $2,000, uh, you know, bill at the end when they fix every single thing in the car. Cause then, you know, all right, my car now works good. Now my body has been fully looked at. 
now you can keep on with it and keep it going. Um, I, this, this probably fits perfect with your audience. There's a great quote by Warren Buffett um, about, um, about health. I, I, and I'm going to paraphrase here, but basically he was asked um, or he made a comment that if you were given a car at the age of 17 or 18 and you were told this is a brand new car, this is the only car you will ever have, what would you do? Mm. And, and it talks about, you know, you would park it in the garage, you would take it out to wash it. You would drive the speed limit. You would do all of these things to care for it because you want it to, to last you your entire life. That is your body. Mm-hmm. Your body is the car. You only have one chance, right? And you have this perfectly healthy body when you're a kid. Um, take care of it. You know, do the things that needs to, to happen and you're, it will perform well. Your car will work and will, you know, you'll have fun joy riding it through the, through back roads. You want your body to do the same. You want to have fun with your body when you're 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years old. There's, you know, the, the standard metric of aging, aging has to be this painful process where you can't do things. That's, that's not true. That's made up. That's there's nothing in your body that says that it has to be that way. Um, and fortunately, I see people all the time that continue to show me that, that it just takes attention takes looking and delving and that's not our medical system that's not what it's designed to do it can't do it there's a burden there um, but you can you you the listener can take that can take that and run with it yeah i mentioned uh, but back to your question yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. no i was gonna say what you what you just said is so so right on and that I, I just mentioned it earlier today to someone saying that this has to become a hygiene issue it, it, you know just health hygiene is like we we wouldn't just not brush our teeth for two months. We, you know, we would just not take a shower for two months. And if you, if you do that, you're just pretty freaking gross. So, you know, but it's the same thing with some of these other issues about health. It just has to become a part of your, your everyday life. And once it does, you mentioned, you know, feeling good as we get older and extending those healthy years versus those marginal years That's one of the things that really has excited me and has made it to where I would do this podcast. I'll write the things I write and I'll, you know, get involved with, uh, our company is that I feel so good most of the time. I mean, more time, more of my time than not, I feel really healthy. I feel healthier today, Troy, than I did probably when I was 35 and I was pretty healthy when I was 35. And I want to share that with other people. I want other people to get this. I'm like, I, I use this comparison. I just used it earlier today in the conversation. I'm like, I'm like the cat that brings all the little dead animals to the back of the door to say, look, owner, aren't you proud of me? It's you're, I mean, I'm so excited about learning these tools and tactics and things like, uh, you know, that we're talking about that will help other people just that light bulb go off. And, and if nothing else for them to not be daunted and scared and, and overwhelmed by this information, but to be encouraged that, it can, you, you there you have so much agency over your own health should you choose to take control of the will and and I think that um, things like this are just so absolutely important. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about life. Hey, oh, go ahead. Jason, let me answer the. You saw the question about labs, and I want oh, yeah, 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 to touch yeah, on this. Yeah. This is a this is a a pain point in yeah. medicine. So uh, insurance. Does again sick care? Yep, is what is what we're working under here. So insurance has no real intention of checking healthy people for inflammation or for in-depth cholesterol metrics or your metabolic health. And in fact, over the years, just in my time of practice, less and less lab work is being covered through even your yearly physical. Um, and especially true if, depending on what insurance company you have, you may have zero labs covered. And covered means that it's in the, in the insurance world is that, uh, it is applied to your deductible. Yeah. It doesn't mean it's free, right? Right. Those are two different things. Fortunately, every lab that I listed off and I listed off a good bit, none of those are expensive. Some of those are hard to find. You have to order for them from specialty lab companies, but not, I mean, the most expensive one may be $20. Uh, but I would say 90% of them are under $10 and, you do them once a year maybe. And so it's just a small investment to, to get some of these labs and, and then you have them and then you can do something and then recheck them again in a year. 
if you're billing them through insurance, though, sometimes there is markups on insurance. You know, they a lab costs five dollars. Insurance will mark it up three times that, so it costs fifteen dollars. You know, so if it's an expensive lab and they're marking it up, it can get pricey. Mm-hmm. But that's where these um, companies that are direct to consumer, where it's outside of insurance, how they can keep their their pricing pretty uh, reasonable because they're not having to go through the insurance system. But I'd first encourage you to go through your doctor. I mean, if you have high cholesterol or diabetes or high blood pressure, you know, something like that, you can probably get a lot of these covered or partially covered um, through your insurance. And so try that. And if you have some pushback, then, okay, it's just a, it's just a doctor that, that isn't ready to learn this yet. That's okay. Um, one day they will. And so you, can, you have other avenues to look for. It's not that that's the, the end. You can't do any more. You can always find something. Well, and I think for those of the, you who are listening to this, and if you don't think it's important now to start to exercise that agency that I described earlier, you know, I don't know if you, did you see the headline, Troy, that uh, the U.S. government has saying that uh, high processed foods may not be that bad for you after all, I'm paraphrasing. It was Mark mm. Hyman put it on his Instagram. I'll actually read the headline. I read it earlier today on uh, for an, an, an interview I was doing, this will just make, I can't wait to, to discuss this with, um, with Gus also. It, it literally made my head spin. This was from the daily mail. Ultra processed foods do not cause obesity, says U S government's top diet advisors in bombshell review of current evidence. Studies have been biased. And let's see here. Let me see what else it says. Um, more study is needed before any action is taken is a familiar excuse. Big Tobacco used it. This is what Mark Hyman said about it. Uh, 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 more study is needed before any action is taken is a familiar excuse. Big Tobacco used it to resist forms, and now Big Foods, big Food echoes it to stall action on ultra-processed foods. The only reason why I bring this up is because when it comes to the just the absolute nonsense that is being that is being put out kind of like you know, the media will all of a sudden run a headline that says intermittent fasting may cause heart disease in other news eating highly processed foods may not be related to obesity and you and it's just and we we know all the other incidents that we've ha- been witness to over the last 5 years of just absolute knowledge malpractice on this stuff that you like folks if, if you want to trust the air quotes experts, good on you. Go for it. But I would advise you to start taking control and looking for yourself and being responsible and owning your own health and doing some of these things that Dr. Troy is talking about. Because if you just rely on the so-called experts, which I'm a big defer to the experts guy, Troy, to a fault almost. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to health and wellness, my, my eyes have been so opened and again, it's just like Gus and I talk about all the time on the podcast, and you've made reference to it here today. That does not mean that we are anti-pharmaceutical. That does not mean that we are that there aren't some just amazing uh, breakthroughs that that modern science has uh, availed us that we can we can do we can intervene. However, it's really good to truly own and understand how your body functions for the best care. And when you read headlines like that, it just it's like good grief are you kidding me it's just mind-blowing yeah the the quick and dirty way of of uh for the listener of understanding health news is if it is shocking to you probably don't believe it <laughs> wait until you read you know, multiple years of the same messaging this is the, the is coffee good or bad for you thing. oh yeah you know, clips every year Eggs. It's, it's, it's all the same so if it's shocking to you, maybe wait on it before you act on it and wait till see more things come out um, and just err on the side of caution. So err on the side of health. You know, so don't just go out and just go buy a bunch of cheeseburgers because it says it's OK. <laughs> right. Wait until you have a lot more data there um, and then go to the study itself. You don't have to be some um, really you don't have to be like really good at reading medical literature. A lot of times what's written on the headline or what's written in the article is not actually what the study says. This is very, very common. Um, so it's another good little practice of maybe just clicking the link that it, it links to just seeing, does it actually say that or not? And I would, I don't, I've never, read, I haven't read this article. I haven't seen this, uh, but I have a feeling that it probably doesn't say it to that definite of a, of a declarative sentence there. Um, so I would, 
I would question that. There are some great studies. I'm blanking on his name. Very popular and famous uh, research scientist who put people in a hospital. One group was eating kind of regular type food. One person, one group was eating more processed foods. And every single day, the people in, eating the more processed foods ate more calories than the person, the, the group who didn't. Yep. And it was it's ad lib. So they didn't tell them how much to eat, how little to eat. They just put them in a hospital room for a week, you know, God bless someone who wants to do that and just fed them food. And that's what came out of it. And, and he's re- repeated that study a few times now. Uh, so as far as I know, the studies would lean towards heavily processed food being hyper palatable uh, and you know, triggering our reward system and making us want to eat more than we would have if it was something else. Well, and that's the thing that uh, it may sound like a conspiracy theory, but folks, it's not, it's true. It's an absolute fact that behavioral scientists at these big food companies are absolutely trying to figure out how to make you eat more and not get satiated. That's why the chip bags have gotten so much bigger. That's why the quantities have gotten bigger. That's why, you know, MSG is, is a master of making you not feel full and want to eat more. They know how to, I mean, whenever I started learning about, the links that they go to based on texture, color, uh, palatability. I mean, it's just everything that goes into honing in on not, not satisfying your hunger. Like the folks at Snickers are telling us they're doing, they're not trying to satisfy our hunger. They, they are worried about the behavioral science on how to get you to crush 50 snack size Snickers and the jumbo size. And if that doesn't work for you, we'll make a freaking ice cream bar out of it. Um, and, and you know, you know, I tell you what, what ought to happen on this deal, Troy Jackson, is that I, if I'm the defense attorney, or if I'm McDonald's, I think it was about ten years ago, maybe a little more. Some mom sued McDonald's because they, because of Happy Meal, Happy Meals made her son want to go to McDonald's too much, and that's why he was overweight. He was, and maybe he had diabetes or something like that, and so she was suing McDonald's for giving away happy meals that thus made her son want to overeat. You know, I think this study shows, ma'am, we're sorry, but our food has no, no, no bearing on your son's health. You can just crush all the, the, the chicken McNuggets and all those, those high quality, uh, fish sandwiches that you want because, uh, U S government says there's no linkage to your son's obesity and our great, highly nutritious, uh, mm-hmm. McDonald's foods. So that's, yes. Um, so with, you know, pulling my tongue out of my cheek that it was firmly planted in, let's talk about some ways to protect your endothelium and glycocalyx, uh, Troy Jackson. What are some things that people can do right now to start, you know, we, we know how to keep our muscles looking good, but how to try to keep our skin looking good, but these are things we don't see. So how can we start to work from the inside out? Mm-hmm. So the, there's a lot of lifestyle factors here and they're, essentially the opposite of all the things that cause harm, but the main ones would be, and these are probably obvious, but avoiding smoking. That's one of the biggest ones. Smoking is a very inflammatory process to the vessels. Limiting alcohol intake, which is a toxin. Um, Improving your hydration status. So we are a chronically dehydrated society and the glycocalyx, part of its health is being adequately hydrated. Oral health is a big one that people will forget or not think about that there's a lot of uh, inflammation or small pockets of infection found within our mouth, uh, underneath our gums, uh, within our teeth that are causing, we're swallowing that saliva that has all these inflammatory particles in it, and that's causing problems. Uh, The mouth is also the place that helps convert nitrates, which are from food, into nitrites, which eventually gets turned into nitric oxide. So it's that back, that second pathway, the backdoor pathway of making nitric oxide. So having a good oral health is, is critically important. Uh, obviously exercise, exercise stimulates nitric oxide. And so the more you're doing, the better uh, to a point, obviously recovery is important there. And this is both strength training and cardiovascular quote, exercise, running, jogging, swimming, biking, um, anything that's getting the heart pumping and muscles pumping is going to improve blood flow and increase nitric oxide production. And then there's diet. And and, there's lots of ways that you can think about from a dietary perspective, but the main thing is just consuming foods that are rich in antioxidants and polyphenols. Those are your vegetables. 
the ones that are specific to your cardiovascular system would be onions and leeks and garlic and broccoli and um, Brussels sprouts. These are cruciferous vegetables and, and high sulfur containing foods. Sulfur uh, interacts with the enzyme and helps improve the endothelial health itself. Um, eating organic that's low in toxicants, low in other inflammatory foods like sugar and um, and alcohol. Like we talked about processed foods, like I still think is, is an important player here of staying away from those things. Uh, but I don't get too much in the weeds of specific things on diet because it does get very specific with people and what they do need to tweak and what they don't. Um, but don't forget all these other aspects of proper endothelium. The last thing is just managing your stress, good sleep, all these things you've heard about. But there's each, each thing uh, that improves health. There's a very specific biochemical link to how it improves your endothelium. And so that is the important aspect that you're not just doing this because, uh, because someone told me to. You're doing it because it directly improves the health of your vessels. And that can be a motivator for you to continue doing it. And I think one of the things cool, going back to what we're talking about as far as getting the actual blood work done, getting these screenings done, is that... You know, one of the things that Gus and, I, and you've mentioned it today is that you guys get excited about is you you do the blood work, you send the people away, they they make some of these these kind of minimal inputs that had this maximum output. They come back and you look at their blood work again, and you can see it. I mean, it's not like, well, we hope it's better, we hope things got better. I mean, you literally can see the changes. I mean, that's one of the things I'm excited about. Whenever uh, Gus just did my most recent. Uh, gut biome report. There are some things in there that um, I need to to work on, and I'm a pretty healthy guy. And that's another thing too, folks, is that it, it doesn't matter how healthy you are. These are things. That's what we talked about with, with the very beginning of this conversation. Is these are things that you probably might not even know that are going on inside your body. Go check it, and, and then you can take control before it does become that you know your engine's about to blow up and it's going to cost you a lot. Instead, just go ahead and do that to make those corrective actions now. And I also liked what you said, Troy, I thought was really awesome, man, is how, you know, a conversation I've, I've had on the show before is this whole idea of medicines, the, the pill stacking. There's just so many different prescriptions stacked on top of that because of what you said earlier, one pill fixes one thing. Whereas if you take the natural approach and you're in you again, if, if we're talking about life or death or temporary, or whatever, again, I don't want to sound like we're just so anti-pharmaceutical and people think we were nut jobs or something like that. Um, but if you just go to exercising more, the cascade of benefits for some of these natural remedies that you have at your disposal are just so much more impactful. And that's, to me, that should be a great selling point for people to start to understand this better is because not only is it saving you money, but you're just going to get more bang for your unspent dollar. You're going to, it's either put in a little bit of the work and have these great cascading impact of good health or go spend a lot of money, take a pill. And then all of a sudden kind of rearrange your body's biochemistry in such a way that it becomes dependent on the pharmaceutical. You can't get off of it. That's one of the things that scares me, Troy is, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding, maybe it's mythical, but my understanding is once you're on blood pressure medicine, you're pretty much always on blood pressure medicine that it just it's. And so that that has always been enough to scare me into doing everything to try to not have to take blood pressure medicine. Now, maybe it's some medicines, maybe it's not. I probably got it wrong, but it works for me. <laughs> yeah. So once you're on blood pressure medicine, you're always on blood pressure medicine. If you do nothing about your blood pressure got it. outside of that. Yeah. Um, same thing with stat medications, yeah. diabetes medications. If if you say this is the solve for me, mm -hmm. then it's going to be the solve for you. There's nothing else that's going to help protect that or improve that. Um, but sometimes it's necessary, and you know, for blood pressure, uh, it might be that we need to treat your blood pressure, get it under better control, fix the endothelium, fix the glycocalyx, figure out why you had elevated blood pressure in the first place, and then lo and behold, four months later, you're now having low blood pressure. You're you're getting lightheaded when you stand up. So we stop the medication and you're fine. So you didn't need it anymore. You fix the underlying problem. With statins, the same thing. You know, you said we have crazy results sometimes. We have people that, I had some guy yesterday that dropped his 
uh, his LDL he came in to see me was 214. He had some vascular inflammation markers. This was all news to him. He came to me for some other reason. Wow. And this, we just found this in our precision report. And to be honest, I told him, hey, man, we probably should just do a SAD medication uh, until we can figure out what's going on here. And he said, no, let me – he was already healthy. But he was like, let me do a little bit more on the physical activity side of things. He was, I think he was already eating pretty good. And he, I saw him yesterday. He dropped his LDL 50 points. His vascular inflammation is reversed. We never started the medication. He said no to it. Uh, he still needs to improve his LDL. still not optimal, but he did a lot of work in four months to get it there. And that was incredible. I mean, I wasn't expecting that to happen. And I, we see this all the time. Um, you know, whether it's just improving how the system works, you're giving back nutrients for the, that the body needs, and then it just works better um, is part of it. You know, and we have a, and as y'all know, on the podcast, me and Gus and you have a very strong faith background. I'm sure that's part of it, of that, that that they were getting miraculous results that we wouldn't have expected. And that's not for everybody, but we do see this a good bit. And it it's definitely invigorating for us and, and makes us want to continue helping people because we're getting results in a non-traditional way sometimes. Um, but, you know, sometimes we do need the medication. The fire is out and, or the fire is there. And we need to put it out. And then the next step is just making sure the fire never comes back on again. And that's where you can take the medication off. Well, and one of the things that you just mentioned there about that patient that dropped it by 40, 40 points or whatever it was, his LDL, is imagine how empowering that feels. I mean, because that's mm. that's huge, man. I mean, most people probably think they're kind of helpless. They Look, if they're just trained to think that there's, I mean, they're again, they're bombarded constantly with, with pharma ads and all this stuff and they just, and they know everybody they know is on some sort of statin or blood pressure medicine or whatever the case may be. uh, They just think that's just, that's just my lot in life, man. And there's, there's nothing that makes you want to pursue mastery of something like gaining confidence in it and actually getting better at it. And man, to be able to take the wheel and, and have that, you know, kind of say, all right, you know, take the training wheels off. I've got this. Yeah, that's got to just feel so awesome. I know for different things that I've done with my health and different things, that's part of when I started seeing that I can literally control my VO2 max, my, you know, all these other things, and the scores would go up based on actual inputs. Dude, it's empowering. Yeah, we're fed this narrative that our, we can't trust our body. Yeah. That, that it's the doctor, me, has to help you get better. Right. Right. Or, or that you need a medication because it's not going to change otherwise. And we have lose sense that, that there's all these other things that we could be doing that improves our health. And, and it's, it's still shocking to me when I see people who just do some supplementation, some lifestyle changes. We, avoid, we, do, we say we're going to do the medication right now and just how much gets better. And it just, it's, it brings a smile on my face all the time. It's just wonderful because I'm just like, wow, like the body is just in this miraculous thing. It's, it's incredible. And it's just tapping into that, that power and the potential that it has to heal is what I love and what I'm trying to help other people know about themselves. Well, Troy, I know I want to respect your time and I want you to come. I do want to make this a two part series. Like we talked about I mean, cause we, I want to get into the supplementation. We talked about some of the lifestyle, but let's also talk about how we can fill those gaps with some supplementation. And again, mm-hmm. folks, if you want to, if, if you just come back from the doctor or hopefully we've encouraged you to go visit your doctor and find out some of your own markers and figure out kind of where you are, what your benchmark is, then come back. I'm going to get Troy back on and you know, some of the lifestyle choices, which are pretty obvious, but it's always good to have it reinforced, eat right, move, exercise, stay hydrated, all these things, you know, put down the Siggies, put down the Jack Daniels in the middle of the day, you know, all that good stuff, which was really hard for me because I used to like, I mean, I, you know, like Don Draper, I love just sitting around smoking cigarettes and, and drinking old fashions at noon, you know, (laughs) just hope everybody knows I'm (laughs) kidding. I don't do those things, but, um, but just, I want, but there are some other things you can do to kind of turbo boost this or if because of like we talked about, you, you're genetically predis- predisposed for some certain things. We're going to talk about some supplementation and then also uh, maybe we'll dive into some of the things we're doing at Authentic Health to basically take the the giftings and the knowledge and the years of clinical practice that Troy and Gus have put in to, to create some products at Authentic Health that we think are going to be not fixes, not silver bullets, but at least enhancers to some of the good decisions that we're hoping that you will make for your health as you go down the road. So are you you up for it, Troy? Are you going to come back? Yeah, that sounds good. There's still a lot more we can talk about. 
when it comes into endothelial health. Good, brother. Well, I'm so grateful for this time with you. Thank you. I'm glad to have you as a, a friend, a brother in Christ, and uh, a business partner, and a guest on the Authentic Health Podcast, the Jason Wright Show. We're covering all bases here, dude. Thanks, man. I appreciate you, brother. Yes. Thank you so much. Take care. All right, man. Well, that does it for this episode of the Jason Wright Show. Thank you so much for listening. This has been a Texas Titan Media production. Fourth Wall did the music. And as always, thank you so much for listening. Please consider going out to jasonwrightnow.com and signing up for the Vitruvian Letter. Also, please go out to iTunes. It takes like 30 seconds to just leave us a five-star rating. It does wonders for the podcast. I would be so grateful. And with that, until we meet again, go crush it and endeavor to improve always in all ways. I'm out. Thank you.